Gospel reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of John. Just before he is arrested, Jesus prays for his disciples and speaks a line that can be found on the official crest of the United Church of Christ, that they may all be one. Listen for Christ's final words of encouragement and hope for his disciples who would become the church. Jesus said, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received with them, and know in the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. Get all that? Would you be with me in prayer? Spirit of the living God, we pray that you would fall afresh upon this place, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word still speaking among us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's 11.30 on a Saturday night. I'm sitting in St. George's Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Manchester, New Hampshire, completely lost. The entire liturgy is in Greek. People are crossing themselves, standing up, responding without looking at anything. I'm here with my friends Antonio and Chris and their parents. They are Greek immigrants who run the best pizza place in my hometown. There's a lot of press for Chicago-style pizza, which I love and will defend from any detractors, and New York-style pizza, which can also be tremendous, but the Greek style of pizza of New England is its own special style that I highly recommend everyone try at least once, but that's a digression. I'm fascinated by the divine liturgy, which is the orthodox equivalent of the mass. It is beautiful and otherworldly. There are smells, sounds, textures that I have never experienced before. I want to know what is going on, so I lean over to Antonio, who speaks Greek as a first language, and I ask him, what's going on? He starts making the sign of the cross, as as does everyone else. I try to keep up. And without interrupting his seamless participation in this liturgy, he slowly and quietly replies, I have no idea. (laughs) Until this moment, I have been raised to believe that what matters in faith and religion is what one believes, not what one does. The only thing that matters, I've been told, is knowing Jesus. And one of the things that can get in the way of this kind of 
uh, faith is this thing, this rote participation. And yet, as I watch my friends participate in this grand liturgy, I am feeling a bit envious. I don't feel left out exactly. I can understand that some would have felt left out. But in this moment, as a 17-year-old uh, evangelical, I don't feel left out. I'm overcome with wonder and awe, feelings that I had never really felt in church before. Rather than left out, I feel simply compelled to be more deeply involved. This was probably the first time I ever really peeked over the fence into a truly different version of Christianity. I had experienced at this point many iterations of evangelicalism. I'd been to Pentecostal churches in English and Spanish, and I had somewhat unwittingly been to fundamentalist churches, Baptist churches, with friends who I later realized were actually trying to save me from Pentecostal churches. I'd been to my grandmother's conservative but fairly mainline Baptist church, but until this moment, everything I had known had been variations on a theme. This, the divine liturgy of the Greek Easter vigil, was something entirely new, and I was enthralled. As we drove the 45 minutes home sometime after midnight, we all held these little candles carrying the light of Christ. When we got home, we used them to mark the door frames with a sign of the cross. I think this was the first time I ever experienced holy envy. Holy envy is a term that Barbara Brown Taylor uses to describe the feeling we get when we see something from another faith tradition that really speaks to us. It can help us recognize parts of ourselves that our own faith is not speaking to, and it can also send us searching for parts of our own tradition that have been lost or forgotten. It can actually make us appreciate our own faith traditions more, even if it takes a little bit of digging. My own engagement with orthodoxy and later Catholicism deepened my appreciation for the sensual, ritualistic aspects of Christian tradition. My own evangelicalism had opened up a longing for a real, tangible experience of God's presence, but biblical literalism and mistrust of tradition and structure had dispatched with many of the ways that generations of Christians had expressed that longing. Swept up in the glory of the divine liturgy, something awakened in me that it would take decades to truly understand. The desire that I felt to participate in the story of Christ's rescue of the entire universe, to feel meaningfully connected to the cosmos, was suddenly reflected back to me in a format I was wholly unprepared for. As Jesus prays for his disciples in this morning's gospel, knowing that he will soon depart, he gives us a sense that we, that they, are called into that kind of a story. Of course, this is John's gospel. So Jesus almost seems to be tripping over himself, risking over explanation with every word and clause. But at the core of Jesus' exhortation to his disciples is this belief that the disciples and we who trace our twisted lineage back through the ages to those early apostles are called into the same ministry that Jesus was about. Jesus says that just as he was sent into the world, so are they, so are we sent into this world. And Jesus speaks a line that will almost 2,000 years later become the tagline for the United Church of Christ, that they may be one. Jesus was the one who came to at one, to put the world at one with God, not to be a sacrificial payment, but to reveal that we are in fact one in Christ, united in the love of God. Today, as we read this scripture, marks something of a threshold moment. It's the seventh Sunday of the Easter season. It's also the Sunday before Pentecost. 
We are at what should be the fulfillment of the Easter season, the season in which we celebrate the resurrection and continue to wrestle with what that new life means for us. Next Sunday, we will celebrate perhaps what is the greatest fruit of the resurrection, the birth of the church. Now, I'll be the first to admit the church has a long, complicated history. I believe there's a strong case to be made that on the balance, it's done more harm than good. Over and over, Christianity has been institutionalized and warped into something oppressive. Every tradition has that tendency. What begins as a promising new idea is quickly taken over, co-opted. People find ways that an idea can further their own ends, more deeply entrench their power, and suddenly the life-giving, revolutionary aspect is undone, leaving a bureaucratic shell of the thing that once sparked transformational joy. We are not immune to that even in the United Church of Christ. The church has gone through many of these cycles, constant schisms and reformations and divisions. In this long history, the United Church of Christ does actually stand out. It stands out because where almost every other denomination in the country has formed from a split, a schism, a disagreement, often over race, gender, sexuality. The UCC is a denomination that formed not simply from a merger, but from a genuine coming together of different voices, traditions, and ideas. One of the legacies of that is our congregational polity. That means that each congregation is self-sustaining, free to discern and interpret God's call to that place and that moment, that's amazing. I love congregationalism. I love that we have diverse congregations, each with their own distinct stories and practices. I like that we don't actually have to agree on what to believe or how to do anything. But our spirit is meant to be a shared spirit. We are meant to constantly be peeking over the fence into other communities and traditions. One of the pitfalls of congregationalism is that it can slide into a tunnel vision, a kind of bureaucratic approach to faith that we are, to the faith that we are joyfully called into. We are unique, independent communities with unique building needs, unique committee structures, unique challenges. We can, if we are not careful, get stuck in the small picture. There's a lot to be concerned about. We are in a season of discernment as a congregation. You probably read in the last rites that we're launching something we're calling the Oikeo Project, a conversation meant to offer up a vision for what Westminster's future might look like here at 4th and Washington. How should we stay and be in this place? What is the vision for this moment? What is the new thing God has prepared us for? These are big questions. We can't answer these questions without digging into some of the specific needs of this community. We probably have to get down into the details. We'll have to turn inward to find a lot of these answers, but I hope that we will also continue to peek over the fence, to look to our neighbors in faith and perhaps even to our literal physical neighbors, to consider what the next model is for being church here. There's something special that we are called to. I believe that. Exactly what remains to be discerned. Some of it will undoubtedly be small, simple, particular to this place and this people, some of it won't feel grand and sweeping and majestic, but it will be grand and sweeping and majestic. It will be part of that great cosmic story that swept me up in its grandeur long ago that continues to sweep us up and call us into more and more into 
resurrection and new life. We are not our own. We do not exist here solely for ourselves. We are here for our neighbors and for one another. We are here for God. But we are also here to tell the part of the story that is particularly ours to tell, the part that nobody else could ever tell. Exactly what that is remains to be seen. I pray that we will continue to look within, to search out what God is calling us to be in this season as we move from the season of Easter into the season of Pentecost. I pray that we would do so with a new Pentecostal resurrected spirit. And I pray that we will continue peeking over the fence, searching the unexpected pages of that story, looking in the nooks and crannies where we haven't considered because we are not called to be the 501c3 at 4th in Washington. We are not called to be a church at 4th and Washington. We are called to be the church at 4th and Washington. We are call, not called to be simply a particular community of people that worships in this place. We are called to tell the big story the story of reconciliation, the story of healing and justice and freedom of all being made one in God, wherever we may be, whoever our neighbors may become. We are not a church. We are the church, created and called to this particular place and this particular moment right here, right now. And I pray that we will get swept up in the wonder of that glorious calling, because it is a glorious and wondrous calling. So may it be, and may it be so. Amen.